Hey guys, Ryan here at Blake Size Studios and welcome to the Gear Curiosities episode that I've been looking forward to making all year long. Today, I'm checking out the Line 6 Pod Go. This sleek little floorboard was first shown off at NAMM 2020 before the end times, and I waited about five or six months for units to start shipping, and then another couple months to actually get my hands on one since everywhere was out of stock. And so I've spent the past about three months on and off playing with this unit, and I can safely say it was pretty much everything I expected. Nothing more, nothing less, and that's not a bad thing because I think this kind of product is what Line 6 has been missing for the past half a decade with their Helix stuff. Um, they've done a really good job on the offshoots in terms of like the HX Stomp, the HX Effects, you know, packaging their amp modeling and effects modeling into form factors that I think make a lot of sense for the, uh, the overall architecture they've built. But I think those products, and especially this, or something like Helix Native, make a lot more sense than a full-blown Helix floorboard or Helix rack, and hopefully I'll make a case for that in this video. If you're a new viewer to the channel, you probably won't know, but I spent basically all of 2019 reviewing the backlog of Line 6 pod products, starting with the 1.0, going to the 2.0, XT, X3, and of course, ending it off with the Pod HD. So I feel like I have a pretty good perspective, a pretty decent understanding of Line 6 pod history and most of their product stack as a result, since they all kind of share a similar kind of modeling technology, but this is not only going to serve as a um, sequel to that series, but also as kind of a, a vehicle to talk about my thoughts on Line 6 Helix as a whole. And some of you that may have not kept up with the news on this product might be wondering, you know, what, what the hell does that have to do with it? This is a, this is a new pod, right? Um, and in fact, why are you looking at a floorboard? You know, I've looked at nothing but the bean-shaped desktop units. First of all, this isn't entirely new behavior from Line 6 with the launch of the HD series. They actually put out floorboards before. And I think the reason for that is a lot of the things I went over in the review of this, because by the time this rolled around, this form factor doesn't really make sense for pod. Yes, the pod started as an original bean-shaped device for desktop, but it made sense then and even to some extent during the XT generation because you had a knob for everything and that's it. Like you, what you see is what you get. Yes, you can pick your amp, you can choose the EQ, you can pick an effect, um, you know, and not like the 2.0, you can hold down a couple buttons and, and get a little bit more control that way, but that's it. You know, there's no menu diving, everything's at your fingertips and that makes so much sense for a product, especially that time period when computing power was limited, even internet access was limited. And so having everything right then, right there that you can practice with, hell, you can gig with, great product idea. And as time went on, you know, you're having to dive through 50 menus to change a, a tone setting on a tube screamer. It just doesn't make sense, especially on a little display this big. So I would not be shocked in the least, especially given the overall product architecture of the Pod Go, if we never see a bean like this again. And... In fact, Line 6 has themselves said, well, Helix Native kind of does what the beans used to, so don't expect one. The main reason I don't think we'll see a desktop unit, though, and why I went ahead and purchased one of these for review, is that this thing is pod in name only. This is not a new product. This is baby Helix. They basically took the Helix platform, streamlined the form factor, took out a lot of the you know, controls and I.O. that they know 90% of you know amateur to semi-pro guitarists aren't using anyway and they you know made the processing power a little lower to fit it all in this chassis they took away some options in the signal chain and put all the effects in amp modeling and ta-da now it's pod for reasons um to say the least i i don't really agree with their marketing here they basically relegated pod to the i guess lowest most budget friendly tier 
of the Helix product stack, which I guess is fine. Pod has been effectively dead for the past five to 10 years anyway, so it's whatever. My main contention is with the marketing and how Line 6 was so gung-ho around Helix's initial launch about saying, you know, oh, don't compare HD and Helix. This is this is not HD2. This is built from the ground up, completely new technology, blah, blah, blah. And now they've shot themselves in the foot again by saying a Helix product is a pod. So by extension, Helix is pod and pod is Helix. Which is it? You know, I, I, it doesn't really matter. The thing is, quit trying to bullshit your customers. We know what you're doing, you know. We know you're not scrapping your entire foundation of AMP modeling, and that's completely fine. I mean, they brought back pretty much all the legacy effects from HD and XT and, you know, reworked them and made them compatible with here. You know, you'll find a lot of the custom AMP models, custom effects models, and that's great. Just don't bullshit a bullshitter. <laughs> that's ultimately all to say that if you know what a Helix sounds like, you know what the Pod Go sounds like. So the sound signature of this product is definitely the least interesting thing about it because we've, I mean, we've heard Helix since 2015. You can pull up a trial of Helix Native and hear what this is going to sound like. The interesting thing is how you use this product, the IO, the signal routing, the limitations thereof. And there are a couple merits to labeling this a pod. In fact, this is the direction they're going with pod using their overall Line 6, you know, the Helix architecture as the backbone for all their products and then just, you know, subdividing it in how you use it. I'm fine with that because this thing is far easier to use than the HD ever could dream about being. Uh, it's not as easy as, you know, 2.0, 1.0, but it's a hell of a lot more capable too and a hell of a lot more capable than this um, to the point that I don't really feel the need to use editing software with this. It, it's there, it's good. But to me, the models on here really aren't that complicated to begin with to warrant hooking up a USB cable and diving through, you know, only a handful of parameters each. I might want to do that on some of the competing brands because there's some nerdy parameters I'd like to see. But, you know, for a lot of people, they're just going to stick to that basic page on something like an AxeFX anyway. So if you do that, you're not missing anything on Helix or indeed by extension, the Pod Go. Um, again, there are times where it's like, oh, I wish I could adjust something that's, that's not there. But the, uh, the upshot to that is that unlike on like my AX8, you know, I could just use everything from the front panel and get the exact sound, get the signal routing that I want. But before we go any further into the workflow of this unit, let's go ahead and answer one burning question because I'm sure some of you were thinking it and I think this relates back to why they called this thing pod in the first place because now they can market to existing pod users. Yes, Helix has always been there, but some of those products might be too expensive or simply not scratch the same itch as maybe a Pod HD 500X would for those users. So now they have something that is kind of a direct replacement for that. So those people that have skipped out on Helix so far, or indeed other modeling platforms, might be thinking, how does this sound compared to Pod HD? Again, if you've heard HD versus Helix already, you know the answer to this question. But for those of you that do not, here's some snippets of what the HD sounds like compared to the Pod Go.
Pod Go sound better than Pod HD? Yeah, yeah, it does. We've known that though. Helix has been out a while. Um, is it that much better? Eh, it kind of depends on your use case, I guess, and, and what models you gravitate towards, what kind of amplifiers you like, what kind of effects you like. You know, there are certainly instances in both those comparisons and other ones I've done for my own sake that's like night and day difference. You know, you can hear the detail, you, whether it be resolution of the output frequency response, or they have better component level modeling, or they modeled things that they just simply couldn't with HD. Who really knows? But you can absolutely hear the accuracy improvement. Others, uh, kind of a mixed bag. And to be honest, I don't really perceive much of a difference in feel or responsiveness going between HD and the Go, going from like, you know, 2.0 to HD. You can absolutely feel something there, whether it be just a small amount of latency decrease or the responsiveness of your you know, pick attack or how the volume and tone controls interact. It's pretty comparable. It wasn't bad already. So, you know, obviously we're at the point of diminishing returns with that. And again, there's other amp modeling hardware out there and even, you know, VST plugins that I feel like do the cranked tube amplifier sag in response better in my opinion, but we'll have to save those comparisons in a more direct manner for another day. Um, that is all to say, it's an improvement, I think, overall. Is it going to be worthwhile to upgrade? It's kind of going to depend, but if uh, you've been rocking your same amp modeler for the better part of eight or nine years and you like some of the new sounds you hear out of here, then yeah, there's a lot worse uh, ways to spend that kind of money. So with that, let's have ourselves a tour of the pod go and talk about how you navigate this thing to make the tones you'd like before we get into some more tonal experiments, starting with the I.O., which includes... Basically everything most people would need and, and nothing that it doesn't uh, very much sticks with the theme here. We have a guitar input. That's it for instrument inputs. No XLR, no Variax, none of that crap. This is just grab a classic guitar, plug in and start playing. And that is one thing that I like about this whole philosophy of the Pod Go is that, you know, they kind of ditch that with Pod HD for the longest time, even from X3 to HD, it was like, Okay, so we're gonna add all these effects. Oh, well, while we're at it, let's add an XLR. That way you can plug in like an acoustic guitar or, you know, mic up something. Okay, well, if we're gonna do that, then I guess we have to add like vocal preamps, compressors and all this stuff. It's like, no, stop. What are you doing? <laughs> People bought pods because they wanna play a guitar or a bass through it. Give us that. And that's what they realized people wanted. Guitar input, good enough. You have an input for an optional expression pedal or a seventh and eighth foot switch, which you can, of course, assign to whatever uh, compatible models you have equipped. There is an effects loop, which is stereo. Very nice. Send and return. Again, with the uh, signal chain, you can turn that on and off at will, either you know assigning it to one of the foot switches or you can do snapshots if you prefer. This also doubles as an auxiliary return, which is probably my favorite way to use this. You know, you could take your phone, take your you know, line out, convert it up, plug it through there, mix it in how you want, and you have a, a silent jam rig that you can you know control with foot switches and expression pedals. A very good idea that doesn't require any additional I.O. on their part. It's just digital routing. After that, you have the main outs, which can be either balanced or unbalanced. They went the classic pod route and uh, included TRS connection. So you know just convert that up and you're good. Um, you've got an amp out, which is extremely interesting. The philosophy behind this is one that I highly support, and most of the time, even on really capable hardware, you kind of have to sacrifice the effects loop to do this, 
And with this, you actually don't have to, depending on where you place it in your signal chain. Um, the idea is that you take this out and then you plug it into, say, like a monitor or, you know, an effects return of an amplifier. And that way you have stage sound, you can monitor yourself there, but you don't have to sacrifice the main output. So you still have stereo out going to the in front of house. You can still use the effects loop if you want to throw in a couple outboard effects there. Life is good. Well, unfortunately, the amplifier out isn't terribly customizable in the way that I want it to be because what I want the amplifier out to do is one of two things. Either A, have the full signal chain in, in mono, which is fine, um, and you know put that to an FR, FR monitor. That way you still have your you know, standard output to the front of house, which again, a lot of monitors, you could just daisy chain and make that work anyway. Or I would like to disable the cabinet section and run that signal through like a solid state power amp to push a four x 12 or two x 12 cabinet to get the in the room or on stage sound that I wanted without, again, having to sacrifice the stereo outs. Now, because this device is a little limited in power and you don't have parallel paths to play with, they get around this by either letting you send the full signal chain out or by letting you send everything before the cab block out. So, you know, you're still doing a little bit of parallel processing and for a lot of stuff that works fine. However, if you want to have stereo effects, this doesn't work. So say for instance, I was just wanting to run a mono delay, mono reverb into a cab block and then amp out to a cabinet on stage, everything works fine. However, if you run stereo effects, which have to be done post cab on this particular platform because the cabinet section is not stereo by default for whatever reason, and you can't make it stereo, uh, then, you pretty much lose everything after the cabinet. So you either have to run a cabinet sound into another cabinet, which may not sound good, most of the time it does not, or you have to send like basically a completely dry signal to your monitoring situation and only front of house is gonna get your effects. Um, so close, but yet so far. Uh, for most stuff, I think this will be fine, especially if you only run mono but it's a little bit of a missed opportunity that I'm, I'm kind of bummed about. You, of course, have your headphone output, which, I mean, some Fractal Audio products can even say that, so I guess I gotta give a thumbs up for that. And USB audio, I believe this is 4x4, which will allow you to not only use this as an interface, but you can actually reamp through USB, which is great. That means you record once in the analog direction, and then you can just send a digital signal back and forth from your DAW and do everything you need to do, and, and probably more for a lot of people that are gonna be looking at a device like this. So you combine that with the main outs and you know, your headphones and auxiliary return. And I mean, this could be the center of your workstation depending on your overall setup. And uh, once again, gotta give them props for using DC power this time, nine volts, two and a half amps, no big transformer brick like you have with the original pods. If you wanted to integrate this with other outboard gear, you very well could run this off of a standard pedal power supply, which is very nice. And that brings us to the front of the pod go. And I think this is what really sold me was just how sleek and minimalist this is. Again, it's missing a few things that, you know, as a like a professional product I would want to see. But I mean, for so many of us weekend warriors, this is going to be more than enough. This layout combined with the tones, combined with the signal chain is really like, you know, the high schooler's first real amp modeler. It does that really well. Or if you've got something that you just want to gig out with every now and again or something to take to a rehearsal space, this really fits the bill. Starting from right to left, we have an integrated expression pedal, which might be controversial for some people out there who prefer to choose their own and there's nothing stopping you. You have an expression too. Um, but I'm going to tell you straight up, for a product that costs $450, 
this is not optional. This needs to be there, and I'm glad it is. It's kind of a legacy feature of the floor pods, and if you're buying a product like this, it makes no sense for the manufacturer to shave off you know, $50, $25, if they shave off any amount of money, because they probably wouldn't, and then make you turn around and have to bring something that adds bulk and all that crap. This is not a modular system. You can make it if you want, but it's not designed that you know, with that in mind. This is, you throw this in a backpack, you take it out, and that's your rig. So it really does need an expression pedal, and I'm glad to see it there. Hopefully the quality isn't an issue. Won't know until long term. Um, you know, the Helix had some problems, and that sucks, but, you know, for me, I think that's something that just needs to be there. Further over on the bottom row, we have eight foot switches, which kind of change their functionality depending on what screen you're on. Right now we're on kind of the live pedal board playthrough setup where you have each one assigned to an effect. You can disable that if you want, or it'll kind of auto assign as you go. If we change over to a different screen here, as you see, they still do the same thing, but then we can switch to mode using this foot switch. I'm in snapshot right now. You can change presets using here. You click both of these at the same time. You can choose one of four presets in this bank. And of course, you've got your dedicated tap tempo. Now, none of this stuff has scribble strips like you'd see on the higher end Helix products. That's not something you should expect anytime soon on something that, again, costs $450 though. The top row is mostly where you're gonna live when you're creating or tweaking your presets. And looking at it beside the HD, it is absolutely minimalist by comparison which is kind of funny because, I mean, there's not that many less rotary knobs. You know, you still got kind of the, the same overall layout as you would in this section of the screen, but because you don't have dedicated amp controls and they got rid of a lot of this garbage and every one of them do in some ways more, but in a lot of ways less, which makes things easier, it's just far easier to navigate and did not require a trip to the manual at all for me to find every menu and to get to everything that I want to get to. The screen is certainly the centerpiece that allows the controls to flow as smoothly as they do, and it's not the most high-resolution thing out there by today's standards, but it completely destroys the Pod HD in terms of color content and resolution. You got plenty of real estate to work on whatever you're doing, whether you're on the main signal chain screen here and navigating between all your effects. You got the bottom row that will allow you to change all of the parameters on each effect. You can go over between the different pages if it does have more than one. So on your time-based effects and especially amplifiers, you'll probably have to navigate between different pages using these page left and right buttons. But once you get there, everything is aligned to one of these five rotary knobs. So, you know, you like your mix, your depth, level controls, your amplifier tone stacks, all of that is tied into here, which makes so much more sense than having dedicated controls nowadays anyway. Not only that, but everything on the screen is aligned in rows as well. So this one is what you navigate the top of the single chain with. This one is where you change models and other context dependent situations. The other hardware buttons have one or two functions at most where you know, something like action, you can pick up your effects and drag and drop. You can change your view with the home button. You click both of these at the same time for save. You click both of the page in to go to your settings. You navigate these by clicking in the rotary knobs themselves. So they do have that control. And it's all just really straightforward and you know everything is where you think it should be. And of course you have your master output as well. The only consequence of this implementation is that there are so many effects models per category a lot of the times that you're gonna be sitting there and scrolling through until you find the one that you want. Now you can click in here and, and uh, you know get a little bit more of a list, but even then you're not seeing a whole lot of them. So compared to the desktop you know, software where you can kind of see everything at once and then and pick and choose. Not as user friendly, but eventually you'll get acquainted with it and it's not like there's so many out there that is completely impossible to use. The biggest departure from the other Helix products is the way this manages its signal chain. That's kind of how Line 6 has been dealing with all of its product derivation with like the HX Stomp, for example, where you only have six blocks, you can do whatever you want with them, but the DSP is limited to that. Whereas full-blown Helix, you know, you can split paths and have them running back into each other, all this stuff. This one kind of aligns better with the original spirit of the pod better than I think even HD did. This is kind of like XT X3 where there's a semi-fixed signal chain. There's always some stuff there, but you can always disable it if you don't want to use it. But just like X3, you can't necessarily substitute it for other stuff. Um, so for example, you always have an amplifier block. You always have a cabinet block. 
For most electric guitarists, that's completely fine. We always need that anyway. But if you're running like a DI bass signal, you cannot take those blocks and substitute them for something else. They're not free spaces. These are dedicated in the DSP. Just like you always have a, a volume block that you can move pre or post amplifier, which is by default what that's assigned to. Uh, same with a wall block. You always have a an EQ block that you can use to sculpt stuff after the cabinet. And then you have kind of like four free spaces where you can put them anywhere you want. You want uh, four stomp boxes, you can do that in front of the amplifier. You want to put a couple before for overdrives and compressors. You want to put a delay and reverb in the back. You can do that. But what you cannot do is substitute, say, that built-in EQ for a reverb. It just will not let you do that. And even though you have four blocks to play with, it doesn't necessarily mean you can run all of the most power intensive effects at the same time. If I ran one of the particularly DSP hungry delay algorithms into one of the more complicated reverbs, there's a good chance that the chorus I want is unavailable because I don't have enough processing power left over. I'll be limited to some of the more simple stuff and you can run into that on the drive and distortion sections as well, which is why they had to cut two effects that were just simply not usable on this. Um, there's the king of tone, there is the prince of tone, so you get one half of that pedal and uh, one of the other reverbs, I believe, maybe one more, but I want to say it was a total of two that they couldn't pour it over. Other than that, they're all here. Just don't expect to be able to carry your 13 block ambient patch from Helix to Pod Go. It's not going to work. But again, I think for 90% plus of guitar players, especially high gain guitar players who most of the time need a drive pedal and you know maybe a clean channel every now and then and delay for... Uh, some of their solos and, you know, maybe some modulation for the cleans, your basic stuff, this is going to more than cover it. The difference with something like this compared to the way I work on, you know, fractal audio equipment is that I can do almost everything I need to for at least one song and for a lot of times most songs in one preset using scenes where you have, you know, XY switching. Now on the new stuff, you've got, you know, four channels to play with. Not going to happen on here. You got basically one preset and that's your sound. Now, if you treat this as a one channel pedal platform, you could probably get all the sounds you need using the snapshots because snapshots work like, you know, uh, scenes and well, they call them one of the other in uh, competing models, but you can recall the states of different pedals and, and blocks and, you know, you turn on a drive in one snapshot, you can turn on a delay in another one and turn off the drive and you're still on the same preset, but you cannot change the amplifier sound or the cab sound. So, uh, like I said, if you just like plug straight into a basement kind of guy and you need a pedal or two, one preset will probably do it. But if you need a change from a high gain rectifier sound for your lead and then you want a, a completely different amplifier for leads or you need a clean sound, you're going to have to use multiple presets, which is fine. That's what the bank functions are for. And the switching latency is, is pretty damn good. <laughs> Thank you.
So up until now, I've mostly focused on the usability aspects of the pod go. And I think honestly, line six has knocked it out of the park in distilling the helix into something that is more widely adoptable, makes more sense for most people, and is at a, a better price point. Everyone wins, in my opinion. The, uh, the thing I've been kind of coy about is my actual opinion on how it sounds, because I mean, yeah, the, the HD comparisons certainly speak for themselves, but I'm going to be careful <laughs> as to what I divulge in this video, because I have uh, more to come for this in terms of compared to other products. But for now, I'll leave it at, it's fine. I mean, if you can't get a good sound out of this product, you got more work to do. Uh, it definitely has good sounds under the hood. Compared to the stuff that I use on almost a daily basis, compared to the real deal, compared to some of the competing technology out there, it falls short in some categories. Not all. It absolutely nails it in a lot of things and in some ways does it better depending on what angle you're coming at it from. But it still has some of those line six hallmarks that I heard since reviewing the first pod, since I checked out Helix Native on stream. And nothing's changed here, nor should it, because again, it's baby Helix. So let's start with what this thing does really, really well, and that's effects. I mean, that's line six's bread and butter. Obviously, there's plenty of competition nowadays, and you know, once they uh, had a kind of a, a faction split off into damage control and then Strymon effects, then yeah, there's standalone pedals and all that's a whole different Thing to argue, but when it comes to modulation, delay, reverb, I mean, there's some just gorgeous sounding effects on this thing. I um, mean, even you know the legacy stuff that they carried over is still totally usable. I mean, hell, people still love the DL4. That thing's ancient, um, which you know kind of has a lot of those algorithms on here. They've never struggled with that. I mean, I, I like the sound of like the chorus on the Pod 1.0, but a lot of the XT and X3 stuff sounded good. I feel like they took a step backwards in some categories on HD even. But they're, they're back at it with this one. And I think for 450 bucks, if you're already running an amp rig that you really like and just like the option of maybe having a different amp sound every now and then, this is a totally viable product to add some effects to your collection. Because, you know, with four blocks, that's you can do a lot with that. And, you know, even if you don't use the amp and cab all the time, it's, it is there. So, yeah, modulation, delay, reverb, the drives are really nice, especially when paired with a real amplifier. I'm really liking a lot of the driven tones I get out of this when using it in for cable method. It models some stuff that you don't see in some of the competition. You know, there's a claw in there. There's some other crazy drives. They go about, you know, modeling modulation and delay and reverbs in kind of a different way than some others do. Whereas like, you know, Kemper or Axe Effects might have like, here's a bucket br brigade kind of delay, or here's a hall reverb. And that's great. You know, they, they all sound awesome to me. And some of that stuff, you can kind of go in and tweak parameters and make it sound closer to a particular pedal that you're going after. Whereas this one, it's like, no, this is the pedal. Like this is the, you know, the Boss Delay pedal that uses a Bucket Brigade chip. Here is a Boss DD7 model. Here is a, you know, 2290 model. Here's whatever. They do that for a lot of that stuff. They, they have their generic, you know, legacy effects as well. But if you like working in that, you know, pedal mindset, then you'll probably like, you know, pulling up the, uh, let's say I got the dual delay here, but I can always go to multi-tap. There's a simple delay. Um, they've got like a memory man and, you know, that's just for the delay. But um, if you like that stop box style, you know, I only want to model what is on the pedal, then you'll probably like this unit a lot. <laughs>
Continuing down this road of the good, the iffy, and the ugly, I guess we <laughs> have now arrived at the iffy, the amp modeling. There are some outstanding tones to be had on here, and the firmware updates over the years has only done the Helix platform uh, more and more favors, and they're all on here. You know, you've got the, the Rev purple and, and red channels, really cool stuff like that. The Litigator, um, great model, gives you some D-style, you know, boutique tones, a lot of stuff there. But... In both quantity and quality, this is really a step backwards in a lot of ways from previous pod generations and from stuff that's coming out right now in this price bracket. Before I sound too nitpicky, I do want to point out the limitations that I feel this product has, I find to be far more acceptable and I'm far more willing to overlook on something that costs 450 bucks compared to a full-blown Helix, which costs, you know, $1,300, $1,600. You know, it's okay to me to be on an already kind of constrained platform. You can't really do much with the signal chain anyway. So, okay, fine. It's not going to have the most outstanding amp modeling ever. It's good. It's really good, actually. Um, and again, it, it fits the $450 price bracket. If I had that exact same sound, though, today on something I paid, you know, three, four times as much for, I'd be kind of pissed off. And I'll explain why. Number one, quantity. The amount of amp models on here, I don't even think is as much as X3 was, you know, we're missing some some pretty important ant models, I think, for just high gain alone, you know, and I'm, I'm not much of a snob when it comes to cleans and a lot of crunch stuff, but they've done the, the same thing Line 6 loves to do, and they've got like half, probably closer to a full dozen plexi derivatives. Of course, there's like bright channels and normals and jumps and all that kind of stuff, and, you know, 
Fractal Audio is just as bad about it, but they put in everything else too. You know, there's not many amps besides a couple transistor amps that, you know, Fractal Audio does not model. Um, and, you know, like a Kemper, if someone has profiled it, you can get that amp. On here, it's just missing so many things that I'm scratching my head and wondering, well, why have they not modeled this yet? For instance, take the dual rectifier model. There's the classic, you know, red lead channel model, but which one? Vintage mode, modern mode, is it the three channel rectifiers, is it the two channel, you know, rev G, rev F? Um, why isn't there the orange channel? A lot of people prefer the orange modern and to boost that, maybe some people would have liked the clean channel, but whatever. Uh, there's only 15150 model, the original one. Maybe someone like me would have liked to play with the crunch channel, boost that one, or you know, the 6505 plus slash 5152. How is it the year 2020 and they still don't have an EVH 5153 model? And there's just all kinds of stuff like that. Um, you know, like diesel VH4, yada yada yada. Just so many core tones that you know are, are iconic in the space. And those are the kind of amp models that I think people should be buying amp modelers for because they're hard to get that sound without getting the actual thing. And you know, the actual thing is super expensive. So I'm still pretty disappointed in the amount of amp models that are missing that are just kind of no brainers to me. Given their resources, it's kind of inexcusable in my opinion, especially when you have competing brands like Moore who were practically no one you know, five, six years ago. And now they have most of that catalog covered on their own. So there, there's a lot of work that I think still needs to be done in, in covering all the territory that needs to be covered in the high gain side of things. They do a better job on, on others. And maybe that's just the, you know, the market they're trying to hit. But um, I feel like metal is kind of their bread and butter considering how many people use the you know, original pod and the pod XT generation to create so many iconic metal albums. Of course, it doesn't matter how many models you have if 75% of them aren't usable, but I feel like this also has some hangups in the quality department as well, because, you know, out of pure transparency, I've listened to several dozens at this point, uh, shootouts, blind shootouts, both, you know, isolated in, in a mix between like Helix and Axe FX and Kemper and real amplifiers. And, you know, in most of those scenarios with all other you know, variables equalize, same impulse response or same whatever. Um, I really can't tell a difference which is which. You know, I can hear a difference, but I can't be like, okay, well, you know, that one's that one. But once you A, B test them live, completely different experience. Uh, not even just in the field, but you hear things that, you know, real amplifiers do that this does not or certain things about real amplifiers that the competition is getting right that this is not or that this is over-exaggerating or under-exaggerating. And, Line 6 still has a sound. The Pod Go is not nearly as uh, caricaturized, if you will, uh, as like the X3 was, for instance, you know, where a lot of the distortion, <laughs> like Leon Todd would say, uh, sounds like, you know, Rice Krispie treats in your mouth. But there is certainly a sound to this where the distortion profile on all the amplifiers is, is just a little smoother sounding to me than the real thing. Um, and, you know, I, I feel like on some fractal amp models, they go the opposite direction. It's like too hard, like too crisp on the attack. Um, but there is a smoothness to this. There is almost a, um, a lack of reactivity comparatively in the low end, or at least in the power amp resonance. I'd never feel like I can dial in the same kind of depth and presence controls that you can on real amplifiers, at least on, you know, comparing these same amplifiers. Now, there's some models in here like the Friedman and uh, some of the custom models I, I really like, and I think they do a good job. But um, just strictly, you know, apples to apples comparisons. There's, there's things about this where it's like, oh, I want to go into an advanced option and let me see if I can fix that. But there are no advanced options. I mean, they have a sag and master volume and stuff like that, but you know, there is no changing a uh, speaker impedance curve. There's, there's nothing like that. There's no, um, output compression or, or crazy stuff, which is fine for what this product is trying to do. So my experience has been a lot of, you know, flipping through and going, oh, look, you know, there's Mark IV lead. I've got that amplifier. Let's, let's A-B test it. And being like, eh, it's close, but something is off. It's kind of back in that uncanny valley of sound. And then you go to like, you know, pull fat on this amplifier or, or pull bright. And then you go back to pod go and it, it, that control isn't even there. Um, and then you want like a modded Marshall sound and, you know, there's no Jose or Cameron style Marshalls besides like, uh, you know, you got the Freeman stuff, which is close, but not exact. 
and their 2204 mod is basically like just sticking an EQ curve in front of one, which doesn't sound the same. Uh, you can't really replicate the, the clipping diodes. You can't really do the cascading gain stage thing of one. Then you end up throwing EQ on the end, try to fix fundamental problems that just doesn't sound as good because you should be using that for surgical cuts and you throw a bunch of drive pedals in front to try to do stuff. And then you're out of blocks and, and then you're sitting there just like, why didn't I just plug into my amp? <laughs> so again, as a, uh, kind of someone's first serious modeler or, you know, just wanting to experiment with something, it's hard to really complain about that kind of stuff at 450 bucks. But the fact of the matter is, I, I think it should be better by now. Um, it, again, people can debate me if they would like on the sound quality, because I, I have, like I said, upcoming content to hopefully address that. But, you know, just the, the lack of variety in just some areas, you know, it's like they, they kill it and like the rev generator and, and some of the other models. And then they miss, again, things that I think are really obvious. And then with the models that are there, you know, they miss easy stuff like that, like the pull fat or the pull bright. When they do have it and others, like the Friedman uh, Brown Eye has like all of the controls there. It's just frustrating. It's it's inconsistent. And that, I think that's what kind of bothers me more than anything. If you're going to commit to one thing or like this is the way we do things in the modeling realm, then whatever. Okay, you know, have your shtick and that's fine. If I don't like it, I'll go somewhere else. But it's like, you do exactly what, I've, <laughs> what I'm talking about in, in one amp model and then not in another. And yeah, again, not a huge deal on $450 product, but as a uh, platform, as far as Helix goes, you know, as a whole, that's why it's hard for me to take it as seriously as some of the competition. <laughs>
Then we have the straight up ugly of the bunch, the cabinet section. At the very least, <laughs> on PodGo and the rest of the Helix stuff, you can load your own impulse responses. Um, there's a lot of slots. It's not, you know, it's not exorbitant, but um, you've got more than enough for what most people who would be buying this kind of product anyway would need. If you're like me and have like 5,000 lying around, pick your favorites, make a mix, you're good. If you, you know, getting started, you just want to record some ideas, find, you know, a handful that you like, a few 4x12s, a couple 2x12s, 1x12s are clean, whatever. Put them in there, put your base IRs, you'll probably have more than enough room and you're going to want to use them because all the stuff I was talking about with the amplifier section, that's with everything normalized, okay? That's that's comparing apples to apples. Nothing's changed except the amplifier because as soon as you turn on the integrated cabinets on here, it's a crapshoot. I mean, some of them sound really, really good. You know, I think I've got like the, um, the Engel V30 on here. You know, that was a classic on the Pod HD. It's like the Gent cab, um, and they can sound cool depending on what microphone and the distance you have, but... Some of them are just pitiful, dude. Like some of the ones they pair by default. I was like, how does anyone think this sounds good? And I went over this same song and dance on the Pod XT, the X3, the HD. I've only been doing this for, you know, looking at these products at least for a year. And I feel like I'm going insane. Like I feel like I'm saying the same thing every product and nothing's getting better, uh, more detailed, probably more accurate maybe, but it's the same fundamental problem. You know, you take the greenback equipped 4x12 Marshall model on here, or, you know, Mesa V30, compare it to someone else's IR, it could be professional, it can be amateur, it just does not sound like that cab. Like, it's okay, yeah, I, I see what they're getting at, it's kind of close, but, I, you know, there's plenty of variables out there, what kind of preamps they're using, post-EQ, whatever, but... There is a certain sound signature to some of this stuff within speaker to speaker variants and all that kind of thing um, that just does not translate on these cab models. I don't know if they're doing the, at least the predicted two notes method, the way people think they do it, where they capture, uh, you know, a, a single cabinet with one microphone, a kind of a neutral microphone, and then they overlay the frequency responses of other ones on top of it to get an approximation. I don't know if that's exactly what they're doing or they're doing some other like, neural network training, whatever. But the the end result is just, it does not sound natural to me. And if they are doing this supposed, you know, two notes method, then I don't know what's so different because I really like their cabs. Uh, there are times where I prefer to have a, a standalone IR, of course, but you know, you've got distance and position. They do some other cool stuff that get very realistic, usable sounds. And a lot of this stuff is just, it's like, I don't know. How did no one question this? Um, and you only have distance control. You can't mix microphones, which is kind of what I expected anyway. That's how it was on older pods. But um, with all that in mind, just getting a good cabinet IR is like, you have to. Like, there's no, that's not optional on this product, in my opinion. As you'll hear with some of these presets, I did use the stock cab and it sounded okay. You know, it sounded good, um, especially on clean and, and some of the lower gain stuff. But as you ramp up the distortion levels and, um, of course, I'm biased towards that, uh, but still, I feel like it's far more sensitive and it's just night and day once you put on the IR of your choice. <laughs>
As we wind down this video, there's really only two things left to cover. What I think of the PodGo in particular, and what I think of this generation of Line 6 hardware. Well, the PodGo is pretty sweet. Despite all the criticisms I've had over the past several, several minutes, uh, they can kind of be worked around to some extent. And if you thought the amplifier sounded good enough or, you know, it adds uh, another layer of sound to stuff that you already have, then absolutely be fine and the effects are really awesome as long as you're okay with those caveats and this form factor works for you this is really easy to recommend to a lot of people uh, they nailed the things they needed to to where some of the limitations some of the things that would prevent me from buying their more expensive toys or the vst plug-in versions of it makes sense here you know I still use the pod 1.0 just for fun because they're now in this like yeah I mean it sounds it's ridiculous but uh, when you nail usability, when you nail the simplicity and, and dialing in something quick, you know, you got some room to play with uh, because, you know, people will figure it out. So just be prepared to use impulse responses to get the exact kind of sounds you're looking for if you're looking for something particular. Uh, and, and then everything else, I think, is really just going to fall into place. This is a really cool platform, and I'm glad they took the lessons they learned over the past few years with Helix and put it into something more affordable because that means more people can get their hands on it, better tones, better playability, all that stuff, and I'm all in favor of that. When it comes to Line 6 since the launch of Helix, though, I can definitely say I made the right choice. This has done nothing but confirm that. I've been using VST plugins, I've been using the Fractal AX8 over the past few years, and I just like those better. It is that simple. Usability of this is cool. Um, but for the sounds I'm going after, for what I like to tweak and what I like to dial in and what I like to not have to mess with, it just, it's up my alley more. And I just get better sounds out of, you know, both of those methods than I do on this platform. And again, I'm okay with that on something that costs less than $500. But if I'd spent the better part of, you know, $1,500 on the Helix. Yeah, the the UI and the, you know, it's all pretty and shiny. and uh, Yeah, it'd be nice, fine, but you get over that pretty quickly. It's the sound, it's the, the feel that really sticks with you after a while. And if, you know, this minus a lot of the models was what I got, I'd have been pretty damn disappointed and I definitely would have uh, switched to something. But I, you know, like I said, I think I made the right decision. Furthermore, until Line 6 goes through a fundamental overhaul of their amp modeling and effects modeling architecture, I mean, I, I'm kind of done looking at their stuff. I've, I've heard what they have to offer. I've heard what they have had to offer over the past 20 years. And uh, it looks like they're going to be riding the Helix wave for some time. Maybe this is a sign with this releasing this year that we've only got a year or two left in Helix before they drop something new, but I just don't foresee them dumping that uh, with how successful it was because it is a good platform. I mean, there's a lot of great stuff happening here, but like I said, there's definitely room for improvement and people that deny that for any of the modeling stuff, it, it's just uh, I don't know, delusional <laughs> uh, trying to verify or uh, validate their own product purchases. I'm not quite sure, but there are some legitimate um, drawbacks to this platform. And, you know, I'm not saying it even needs a Helix 2, maybe just more firmware updates, maybe just more model diversity, maybe, maybe, maybe. I, I don't know what that looks like. But what I do know is that uh, I, I'm not switching. That's for damn sure. People <laughs> have asked in the comments, you know, they've seen this pop up and, uh, you know, I'm using like an amp review and talked about it. And they were like, oh, is Line 6 your brand now? Like, did you jump ship? And, no, <laughs> not at all. And I'm not on the Fractal Audio ship either. I'm not an endorsed artist. I, I don't, you know, gig with it or anything. It's just, it, that's the platform that has worked the best for me when it comes to component-based uh, models like this. But, you know, again, this isn't bad. And if I needed a quick travel rig, if I was gigging out in, you know, certain uh, instances and, and didn't want to take a whole lot, this would be great. If I needed a bedroom practice rig, you know, especially 10 years ago, this would have been great. Um, as of now, I, I simply don't need it, but I can definitely say it's a good product. So if you want a heck of a lot of sound without spending a heck of a lot of money, you don't mind some of the uh, limitations shown here, you want the latest Line 6 tone and more familiar trappings while carrying over some of the 
uh, newer advancements on some of the Helix stuff, this is a really good candidate for that. Again, I have some of my uh, hesitations about this product, but if I was starting out playing guitar, you know, as I was, um, you know, 12, 13 years ago, with the quality stuff that there was then for the price, I would have killed for this. And, uh, you know, as a stranded on an island rig, this still ain't bad. So for the money, I mean, I think, like I said, I think they really hit the nail on the head here. But uh, it, that doesn't necessarily translate to the upper echelons of their products because I don't necessarily know that what is included here uh, just scales up that well without a little bit more work added. But that's a topic for extended discussion in another video where hopefully I'll be able to provide some more comparative data for, uh, for my opinions. But until then, stay tuned. And thank you so very much for watching. As always, please let me know if you have any other questions and comments down below. We'll see you next time. Bye.